Welcome back, listeners. We're here. We are continuing our pop culture country tier list with a new country today. Before we get to that, you know, a little intro uh, to the concept for those that haven't joined us for the previous episodes. What we do is we evaluate different countries on their pop culture contributions, success, and, you know, where we really rank them on the Pantheon. Our goal is to do every country on Earth. Yeah, yeah. We're well on well on track. To well do on it. track. Yeah, yeah, we've done two so far. We've started with Sweden and then moved yeah. to Japan. Out of a total of thirty points, Sweden scored a very respectable nineteen point five, and Japan edged it out by three points on a twenty two point five. So that's where we stand at the moment. Yeah, I think we're off to a great start, and I'm very excited to bring our third country into the mix. Absolutely, and our third country today is Neil. Bienvenido a México. Gracias. Oh, look at you. Hey, hey, there we go. Taking out the old Spanish from school. That's all I got. So, Mexico. Uh, we're going to introduce Mexico now with our usual way of introducing to the tune of the Mexican National Anthem and courtesy of our sponsor, Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia. Neil, are you ready? Always. Mexico. Mexico. Officially, the United Mexican States is a country in the southern portion of North America. It is bordered to the north by the United States, to the south and west by the Pacific Ocean, to the southeast by Guatemala, Belize, and the Caribbean Sea, and to the east by the Gulf of Mexico. Mexico covers 1,972,550 square kilometers. That's 761,610 square miles, making it the world's 13th largest country by area with a population of over 126 million. It is the 10th most populous country and has the most Spanish speakers in the world. Mexico is organized as a federal republic comprising 31 states and Mexico City its capital. Other major urban areas include Monterrey, Guadalajara, Puebla, Toluca, Tijuana, Ciudad Juarez and León. Welcome to make. Wow. Do you speak Spanish, actually? I, think I do, actually. Yeah. Fluent or? Yeah, fluent. Dang. It's my yeah. second and a half best language. Okay. Yeah. Second and a half. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So before before Danish, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Okay, okay, definitely. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I thought either you speak Spanish or you're really good at doing the impression of how you, you know, to guess how you might say those words. Yeah. So uh, well done. Yeah, but Mexico, it's a place that I love. I've been there multiple times, especially when I was in the U.S. And uh, just love their culture. It puts a smile to my face every time I think of Mexico. Absolutely. I'm in the somewhat unique position here. This is the first country on our country tier list that I haven't actually been to. That's a cool dynamic. To yeah, I think so, because it'll be a lot of me asking stuff and you answering it probably. But I think the point here, listener, and what we what we really need to get across is that this isn't supposed to be an objective ranking, quite the opposite. This is actually an extremely subjective ranking based on specifically our experiences with the country, right? So previously, when we've talked about Sweden and Japan, you know, we've both been there multiple times in some cases. So we, we knew a lot about them. This is probably an interesting one where I'm going to be shooting from the hip even more than usual. And uh, probably relying on your support, Nicola, as we as we go through. We'll try our best. And the other key here, listeners, is that these are, regardless of how many times we've been to a place or not, these are, for the most part, outsider views. And the view is to get a gauge on their contributions to pop culture, their influence outside of their immediate sphere as a country. Exactly, exactly. Because easily almost every country in the world you can say oh well of course they have music in their own country i mean right. they and of course they do the point here is to find what which countries have had the biggest global impact that we couldn't imagine a world without them in fact that's what we're here to do that's exactly what we're here to do and we're going to kick it off in mexico neil with our first category film and tv so overall if we if we take a top line view mexican film they've won the Pando in Cannes twice, and they've won one best foreign picture to Roma recently, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. A couple of years ago, the Netflix picture. And the best place to kind of start delving into Mexican film this day and age is to talk about Mexican directors mm. who have taken Hollywood 
by Storm. Seems to be that's their strongest suit, actually. Mm-hmm. When even within the realm of film and TV, not so big on actors, not so big on uh, writers, even more. It's it's very much the directors who are uh, first and foremost here. It seems that way, and we have the let's call them the troika of Mexican directors: Alfonso Cuarón, Alejandro Iñárritu, and Guillermo del Toro. Any Powerful. favorites from this bunch? Of those three, I'm actually leaning Alejandro Inarito. Mm. I think he's uh, extremely strong, purely based on my experience of Birdman. Because I haven't actually watched The Revenant, uh, let alone the other films. Not missing out on too much. Yeah, it just seems like a trek. It just seems like a lot. It's going to be an ordeal for me to watch it. And I'm like, I'm sure it's great, but it's just like, I just don't want to you know slog through mm. uh but loved birdman one of the few people i feel who object who just you know universally loved it like a lot of people came away feeling like it was a bit too pretentious or a bit too kind of like me up yeah. It, yeah, yeah yeah up itself but i absolutely loved it go back and watch it regularly just think it's awesome so inaritu is uh, is my guy Quaron, we can get on to unless yeah. you have any in Aritu yeah and on Inaritu, for those that don't know his films have been nominated for a grand total of 34 Oscars and they've taken home eight of them so it's yeah it's which quite is strong. a little low like for that number of nominations you'd kind of want to see more but then again we know Hollywood is quite biased against the old international uh, directors absolutely yeah. absolutely but also there with Inaritu, I mean like huge range right and then Alfonso Cuaron has had 11 Oscar nominations, 4 wins, and that range there, we're talking everything from Harry Potter 3, Prisoner of Azkaban, Children of Men, with your favorite potential Bond, Clive Owen, mm-hmm. Roma, and Gravity, right? These are like four of the of the highlights. Absolutely. And huge range. And if I may, the best Harry Potter movie. Ooh, that's... I don't, I don't remember, mm. to be honest. I think it's... Um... It's well worth a rewatch. There's some interesting time travel dynamics there for Hermione, if I'm remembering right. Okay. She uses the time turner yeah. in this one. It's uh, extremely well made, actually. Okay. So yeah, after a kind of a dodgy Chris Columbus uh, number one and number two for Harry Potter, I think, it, uh, it really hit its stride number three, thanks to our boy, Alfonso. Alfonso Cuaron. Did you see Children of Men? I've been meaning to for so long mm. because I'm such a Clive Owen fan. Yeah. Loved him in Inside And Man. you're an apocalypse guy. I'm an apocalypse guy. Yeah. I enjoy an apocalypse. I, yeah. I, I would label you as that. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people do. It's yeah. a bit, yeah, a little bit uh, concerning, actually. So, Children of Men, love the premise, love the idea, like, need to watch it. One of those films where if I wanted to go watch it, I would struggle to think of where I would find it. Maybe it's on a streaming service or some kind. I think, yes, actually, I think it's on HBO Max. That's where okay. I watched it last because it is a Warner Brothers. So, uh, yeah. And speaking of uh, these films, the Quaron films, I'm recently just coming out of my moon landing um, kick yes, that, I, that, that I fell down a few episodes ago. So I'm still on the old moon, um, the moon topic. Mm. And I do think gravity would be, I know it's not, they're not landing on the moon, but I do think gravity is something I should probably go and watch now. I've heard it's good. I know it's yeah. probably a little bit Hollywood, a little bit kind of uh, simple, but I think, I'll, I think I'll go watch that. I think you should go for it, definitely. Yeah. So Alfonso Cuaron, and then we have the last of the three, last but mm. not least, and that is... Guillermo del Toro. Now, what, I, I have some thoughts, right? But mm. interested to hear, first of all, your kind of unfiltered opinion here. Eight out of 25 Oscars. So again, very strong showing. That's a good hit rate, yeah. Um, to be honest, I'm not a huge fan. You mm. know, all mm. the, the, the Pinocchios, the Pacific Rims, etc. is not really in my swing zone mm. uh, in terms of the, the types of films, right? So Yeah, this is where I was going to go with that as well, because... He's a name, it's like a household name almost as the director. Like everyone's heard of Guillermo yeah, del Toro. And, and Hellboy, Pan's Labyrinth. You know, he has some, exactly. some bangers, right? But then when you look at the list, you're like, well, actually, like, what do we have here? I've, I've spoken, I'm on the record on this podcast of saying that I don't like his Pinocchio. I think it's one of the more annoying films I've seen, actually, in the last number of years. With your favorite actor, Christoph Waltz. Even despite my favorite actor being there, I think it was... Uh, it was a miss as films go. Some great artwork. I mean, it's it's fully stop motion animated to an amazing mm-hmm. extent. And I think it was nominated if, if it didn't win the animated Oscar. But in any case, um, it's impressive. Technically, I just hated it as a as a film, which I think I have to put down to uh, to Guillermo. And then he he's also responsible, if I may, for Pacific Rim, which, mm. sorry, like, I mean, a cool, bombastic idea, heavily inspired by our, fa- our favorite uh, Japan, right? That it's it's all about these uh, massive monsters fighting each other versus robots. But 
it's just very simple and like it has Idris Elba in a very uh, underutilized position in that. Absolutely. Like just a kind of a dumb movie. And it, it's one of those films that I, I walked in thinking, okay, it's uh, monsters fighting robots. And I walked out being like, yeah, I guess the monsters fought the robots. Like it, it, it hasn't, it left no impression on me at all, yep. you know? No. So I actually, I'm, I might be slain for saying this, but actually Guillermo del Toro, I'm like not hugely hyped on. No, and like you said, the name is huge. It's wonderful to say in prepping the episode, I thought I'd get a lot more for Guillermo. Mm. And then I looked him up and I remembered I didn't really like any of those movies, including his one of his most recent Oscar winners, Shape of Water. Mm. Oh, that was one yeah. of the biggest steals at the Oscars. Exactly. Right? I think that's one of those recent examples, like The Artist, you know, where it got super hyped up. We were all talking about it actually for a while. But like, have you seen it yet? Have you seen it yet? And the trailer looked cool. <laughs> But then actually, at the end of the day, it was like, fine. It was just a, a yeah. movie that came and went. And yeah. Yeah. and we don't want to tear the Oscars apart too much, but that was a back-to-back Moonlight and Shape of Water winning Best Picture. We've done an entire episode on yeah. the Oscars listeners that you can go back to. I think that was episode 13. Yeah, they're probably sick of yeah. us talking about the Oscars at this probably, point. Probably, yeah. and of you yeah. about the artist. Yeah, that, I swear that's the last time. I go through phases, listener, just for the new listeners. Like, I, I do two or three episodes in a row where I bring up the same thing, and then I, I forget. So... That was my that was my last artist reference, let's say, and uh, let's call it there. It's banished forever. And while we're there on film in Mexico, one thing that really came to my mind that I wanted to also check in on with you is that Mexico is portrayed in so many many films. That's what, a much longer list. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that's and that's part of the pop culture credentials, right? It's portrayed not always in the best light, which mm-hmm. there's a whole discussion to be had on that. But if I just list, you know, Sicario. James Bond, Spectre, mm-hmm. Narcos Mexico, Dallas Buyers Club, right? Like, and these are just some, right? Oh, the list is endless. Yeah. Like, I, I did a, in the prep for this, I just Googled films set in Mexico. Mm. And I gave up because I was like, this is hundreds of films. Right. Like, this is literally so many. It's an incredibly popular destination, not only to visit, but also for us to visit cinematically, right? right. So it's, it's extremely popular in that sense. And... My biggest exposure has probably been Breaking Bad, actually. So unfortunately, mm. my my impression, my cinematic impression of Mexico has been very much tainted by the world of Breaking Bad. Also, From New Mexico. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Both New Mexico and then oh, south yeah, of the border. They, yeah, yeah. Whenever they go to actual Mexico, the colored grain gets turned all the way orange. So mm. it's like a very, yeah. it's a kind of a, it's almost becoming a trope now, actually, that anytime a show goes to Mexico, the colored grain gets turned way up the yellow right. and you lose all blues, you know, in, right. the, in the color balance. But I guess it's, it's to portray a different world. But in any case, I think, and also with things like Narcos, the, the portrayals that we see are unfortunately a little bit colored by some of the, the characters and topics that Mexico is known for, but still lovely, looks absolutely amazing on film and I can see why things are set there. So you can argue that's that's an influence, right? Like that's, uh, that's impactful. Absolutely, I would say so. And then we have, when we talk about actors and actresses, there's of course like entire generations now of Mexican-American actors mm. and actresses, mm. right? Like even if you, if you just take actors, Michael Pena, for example. Yeah. Fantastic, like, right? That was one who I, I Googled as well, like Mexican actors, and he came up and I was like, wait, really? No. Wait, no, born and, in the US, yeah, right? Exactly, yeah. and there's many of those, right? So... You can also, you can extrapolate a bit like, hey, okay, if, if there was no Mexico, we wouldn't have people like that and blah, blah, blah. But remember, like we've talked about how this is not about ranking the expatriate community, right? you know, it's or, or by people who have maybe descended from these countries. It has to be fully born and bred or at least like heavily uh, raised or spend a lot of time in that country when they're growing up, right? So when you do that and then you, you search online for that criteria, then the list actually gets very, very short yeah. for for world big name actors. And we end up with Salma Hayek. Yeah, that's actually it. Yeah. Because every other name is like from, it's it's a black and white picture because they're from the 50s or 60s. Right, right. I don't know what's happening here. And I, I don't know, is it, is it because like the film industry isn't actually that big in Mexico or something? But like, there are just no big names. All of those famous Hispanic or Latinx mm. actors and actresses who we know and they, none of them come from Mexico. Actually, it was really strange. Yeah. I was I was shocked. Like this I, was, was I was also one of my biggest surprises. I was when we were agreeing on Mexico. I was like, oh yeah, and there's all those actors. And then I looked into it and I was like, no, there there really isn't. Yeah. Now Selma Hayek, very good. Thought she was great actually in even bad films. Like she's been in uh, Eternals. She mm-hmm. had one of yeah. the better roles in that, yeah. in, which is an otherwise not great film. She played but, uh, Frida Kahlo. 
Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah maybe awesome. about 20 years ago or something. Which is like. huge, right? Yeah. Because, and we don't have a category for artists, actually, yeah. but I suppose Frida Kahlo deserves a shout-out no matter what. But, uh, yeah, on the actress front, as we said, unless you include Michael Pena, which I'm like... Yeah, no, no, you can't, yeah, because if you go down yeah. Michael Pena, then you have, you know, he's maybe already second generation. So exactly. I think um, the the issue maybe is what Hollywood does and, and what TV does is it has the Mexican-American actors and pigeonholes them mm. to consistently play Mexicans, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's where these lines get a bit blurred that you could easily mm. think, oh, Michael Pena, he's from Mexico. Yeah, and also kind of similar to that point, Mexican characters are often caricatures when they're portrayed in American media. Absolutely. They're all following the same tropes that we've seen time and time again. Yeah. Speaking with the same exaggerated accent where it's like, yeah. unfortunately, like many other nationalities in Hollywood, are portrayed with a little bit of a comic bent or a little bit of a, you know, a, an unsympathetic portrayal, yeah. let's say. So I do think as well that takes away a little bit from how, how, an audi- how willing an audience is to take a Mexican character seriously in a, in a Hollywood blockbuster. Yeah. Sadly. Yeah, absolutely. So that's... Where, where we can round it on film and TV. And yeah. what score are you thinking in terms of this? Uh, I think I've always had to come back to our mantra on this, which is we have to be fair, but harsh. Yeah, right? absolutely. We're not here to make friends. This is not a diplomatic exercise. <laughs> we are here to rank these bad boys as fairly as we can. So on that basis, film and TV, Mexico, I'm going to give a light three. A light three, three being somewhat significant in terms of uniqueness and success. And that's purely based on the directors we, we mentioned. Yeah, yeah. So the directors are the drivers here. Um, I'm going to go significant in terms of uniqueness or success at two because mm. there's plenty of other countries that can name three power directors. Yeah. Yeah. No, right. but I, yeah, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be swayed. Let's let's keep it like this. So we have a two and a three, right? Yeah. So I'm and, with and keeping in mind that these yeah. guys have also gone off and gone very Hollywood with their films mm-hmm. and done them in English and not in original language That's true. nowadays. So it's not like we're consuming Mexican media, being like, "Wow, it's so Mexican." No. It's quite the opposite, right. actually. Yeah, yeah. That's fair to a lim- Although Roma is set in Mexico, I think the movie. Yeah, and yeah. and Roma in Spanish. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So there's yeah. A, there's some examples, but yeah. I see your point, which is like, are they? Are we? Are, are, yeah, is the world hungry for Mexican cinema or are we praising Mexican directors who have happened to direct very Western stuff? Right, yeah, yeah. who happen to be Mexican, right? Yeah. So a three from you, a two from me averages out to a 2.5 That's on maths. our first category, yes. film and TV. That is maths. We've gotten a few of those wrong in the yeah. past episode. Oh yeah, so. you'd be surprised, yeah. But okay, I think that's fair and, and we're off to a good start. Great. Where would you like to travel next? Which category? Mm. We have, for the listener who, who's uninitiated, we have also music, literature, cuisine, and sport. I think let's have a go on sport, actually. Oh, let's do it. Yeah. Let's do it. A lot to say here about Mexican sport, which actually started very much before Columbus sailed the ocean blue. So in the sure. pre-Columbian era, the Mesoamericans, the Mayans, the Aztecs were already playing a ball game which represented volleyball or racquetball played against the wall. 100%. That's yeah. impressive. And That's actually, cool. any time the Mayans of the Aztecs come up in any of this discussion, you got to kind of pour some out, right? Because that, that's really one of the big influences and things like architecture technology mm. science art like that's where mexico has had historically insane impact not always seen not always not always obvious mm. and then never none less so than sport here right where for sure they've been instrumental in in defining some of the sports we now play today two of the most advanced civilizations uh, of exactly. their times together with with the incas lower down in the andes exactly yeah. exactly amazing stuff so volleyball racquetball i think uh if you, if you want to give them the credit for it, then that's pretty huge, no? I think we could. That, then it would be, absolutely. Yeah. No and I think there could be a line them. drawn there, absolutely. So I, I think they're off to a good start on I'd that, say on that so. front. Nowadays, of course, Mexicans are consumed with football, mm. right? Mm. They love it. Like, it is a football-mad country. It is also being such a big country and being football-mad creates mm. fantastic atmospheres in the stadium. They've hosted two World Cups. They might be the most football-mad country. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that, how much they love it. Close to the Argentinians, but, you know. um, They galvanize global audiences every four years when they play in a World Cup. To the point where this last World Cup in Qatar, uh, 
well, my brother and I, we support Italy, uh, mm. of course, which didn't qualify. Yeah. And uh, we were thinking, oh, who are you going for? You know, and of course, my, my wife is Danish. So I said, yeah, you know, a, a bit Denmark, whatever. Mm. And my brother said, oh, I'm supporting Mexico. And I didn't even for a moment question him and say, why are you supporting Mexico? Mm. Like, what's that about? Yeah. It was more like, I get it. Why yeah. not? Scrappy underdogs on the world stage. Yeah. yeah, love it. And just great vibes all around. They're belting out their anthem. They're bringing their fans everywhere. Mm. They've had great players. They won a gold medal in 2012. But they remain perennial underachievers. Yeah. It's a shame because the, the point that sticks with me here as from the very top of this episode is when you mentioned their population, where they're one of the most populous countries in the world. The 10th most. Yeah. So they should be punching like way higher than they are currently yeah. on the world stage. They should be winning global competitions like that, you know? Absolutely. If you go purely based on population, right? Population and it's a country that really invests a lot in yeah. this sport. And yeah. it's huge. Like, it's not like nobody cares about football there. Like, they should be smashing the World Cup every time, right? I so think they should be not, one of the top countries. Yeah. yeah. So not to be overly harsh or anything, but like, if Iceland, a country of, what, 400,000 people can... Yeah, even less, ...can right? kick yeah. ass at the World Cup, then I think Mexico should be doing pretty well too. Yeah. So that, that one, I'm with you. It's a little bit disappointing almost. Yeah, it is. It is. So, still football mad. And then, did you know that... Mexico has had 200 boxing world champions across the weight categories, which is the second of all time after the United States. I did not know that. And I can't even name a Mexican boxer, I don't think. Maybe now you know Canelo Alvarez. Is he Mexican? Yeah, he's ah, Mexican. Okay. And he's, you know, pound for pound, I think, considered the best fighter in the world at the moment. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Better than Mayweather? I know what Mayweather doesn't fight right now. Yeah. But, you well, know. in so, inactivity at uh, the moment. Okay, okay. And, and, you know, they do pound for pound because, of course, a yeah. heavyweight guy would always knock out, you know, yeah, a yeah, featherweight. Yeah. So right, it's so. like versus the competi- versus right. their competition. Exactly. Okay, well, that's pretty huge. Yeah. He's, he's like the biggest name in boxing, right? He's Yeah, he gets all the big uh, deals uh, with uh, with the zone and ESPN, whatever, to okay. be shown. So, But huge boxing culture, actually, yeah. uh, in Mexico. Combat sports as well, right? Combat like, sports, exactly, yeah. which, which leads us to... Perhaps the the cooler part of this, which is yeah. lucha libre. Love this. This is like when we talk about uniqueness when we're doing these rankings. You cannot fault lucha libre for for lack of originality. Like it is so specific. It is so weird, and just embraced massively by the country and and by the world, right? And so iconic with those masks. And yeah, I yeah. I had those masks uh, also as Absolutely. a kid for Halloween and stuff. You have to give a shout out to Rey Mysterio, I think, who kind of publicized it to the world. I think Rey Mysterio, for me, a sheltered Irish kid, you know, watching WWE or WWF as it was called at the time, I think Rey Mysterio was my first glimpse of what the hell are we talking? What yeah, is this? Because right? he took that lucha libre mm. culture and brought it to WWE, exactly. brought it to with huge success worldwide, right? Yeah. yeah, and became a lot of people's favorite like straight away. His Absolutely. acrobatics is like he's, this guy was amazing, right? Six one nine was that, uh, yeah, the, yeah, the, the, yeah. which I think is a San Diego area code where where he's from. Exactly, so, yeah. and we can't give a shout out to him too much because apparently he's American Mexican or Mexican American. Yeah, right? yeah, so, but. Yeah, but still proud of his roots, right? Yeah, yeah, but yeah, still, yeah. the the lucha libre That's was Mexican. part of that journey, and uh, exactly, who can forget the great Jack Black Nacho Libre? Yes, a kind of an underrated movie, and maybe fell uh, a little bit flat. <laughs> this was his follow up after the unbelievable School of Rock, absolutely, like, which is an all timer classic, and I won't hear a word against yeah, it. Yeah. But yeah, so on uh, with direct comparisons of that, it was very hard for Nacho Libre, I think, to do well. But I still think it's a great celebration of uh, of lucha libre. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And then uh, just a quick honorable mention while we're here to Lorena Ochoa, their best ever female golfer. Mm-hmm. So one of the only non-American female golfers to routinely win LPGA events. Got to respect that. Got to respect, respect that. that. And then uh, a friend of yours. Oh, you got it. You cannot talk about Mexican sports without Checo Perez. What a man, especially this year. Like having to fight against not only a fantastic teammate, arguably one of the greatest drivers of all time in Max Verstappen mm. and holding his own in taking pole position uh, this weekend just now yeah. in uh, winning a couple of races this year so far. I think he's like six points behind Max or something like that or maybe 10 points behind Very Max. Close, yeah. yeah. So absolutely putting Mexico on the on the map for driving Yeah, is probably one of the most successful Mexican driver of all time except for maybe his dad or yeah. Yeah, but I a think few, now he is. Yeah. yeah but yeah, a phenomenal figure, lovely guy as well. I I wanted to really, you know, 
be his like number one fan his performance is just not that great i think over the past few years since he's been in rebel he's had ups and downs and like mm. a few little slip-ups which are not amazing but in any case i think he's he's doing wonders for mexico and uh recruiting those those fans to the sport as well which is fantastic great teammate upstanding professional and let's not forget that before red bull when he was at the various you know force yeah, yeah. india racing point team that changed its name 30 times mm-hmm. He still outperformed his car. He outperformed his teammates. Exactly. And he showed up every week without making any drama, any fuss. Uh, and that's what earned him that callback to Red yeah. Bull. Because let's not forget, he was part of that Red Bull Junior program way exactly. back in the day, right? I think it was a masterstroke for Christian Horner to look at who he was going to get. Mm. Having so many options. I mean, any driver would have jumped at it, right? And he doesn't go for the next world champion he doesn't go for anything no. like that he goes for who's going to put in the hours who's going to be consistent who's going to show up play the team game do what's needed and, and that's the key right he yeah. went for the guy that he knew the ego wasn't going to be bigger than exactly. the car exactly and that's what wins them the championships last year as a constructor and this year again most sure. likely yeah, yeah because there isn't that drama everyone knows where they stand and yeah. again great teammate upstanding profession and it's where your boys I must say that Ferrari have gone so badly wrong over the years, among many other ways, where yeah. they've been like, yeah, we have no number one driver, you know, Charles and Carlos are free to fight, we'll, we'll prioritize both. It's like, okay, come on. No strategy, Yeah. no tactics on top of it, no, and no, total no. incompetence. I'm getting angry just thinking <laughs> yeah, about let's it. Let's move on, let's and, uh, and then, of course, uh, just because you love it so much, I wanted to throw this in there, that baseball is mm. also quite big mm. in Mexico. It's a very highly ranked league. It's a, it's a well-followed sport, of course, bordering with the US. Um, I love baseball. Neil, not so much. Do but not love baseball. Every chance I get, baseball. every chance. Uh, it feels like every country we do, it's like, <laughs> oh, also really, really big on baseball. Like, uh, if I, I can't avoid this topic. Like, can we have one country, please, where we don't talk about baseball? I know we didn't talk about baseball for Sweden, but still, not a fan of. Baseball. We got to find those Swedish baseball players and get them. They're on the out podcast. there for sure. They're out there. They've got to be right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. That's quite a roundup on on Mexican sports. Yeah. Uh, a lot of energy for that uh, compared to their film and TV. Mm. And where are you thinking of scoring them? Yeah, well, I can't give it a three because I just gave film a three for some quite uh, right. some quite negative things. I think actually you can go on a four here, and it's heavily heavily swayed for me by just how unique and interesting Lucha Libre is. Actually, you love that Lucha Libre. It, I just yeah. think I, I'm such a fan of when a country is just all in on the weirdness, you know? It's like, we got to have the big colorful masks. We just have to. And yeah. if, if you were to take them away, because it's like, well, you know, don't we want to focus on the wrestling? No, absolutely not. Like, you know, they, they care about the, the aesthetic of it and how quirky and weird it is. Yeah. So I, I have to appreciate that. I think it's a, an amazing institution. So I think, yeah, let's, let's put me on a four there. I'm also going to go a four. We gave Japan a four. Um, yeah. And some of there's a lot of parallels, for example, the Lucha Libre with the sumo mm-hmm, wrestling and mm-hmm. the uniqueness, but at the same time, how iconic that is in terms of pop culture, right? Where, no, I don't turn on the TV and watch Lucha Libre, mm-hmm. but I know so much about what that is, right? Yeah. So definitely, I'm going to match your four. And that is a four yeah. for sport. In I think Mexico. that's good. I think that's good. Yes. So now we've done sport. And I would say... Why don't we touch on music? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's check in. So our current world champion in music with a perfect five out of five, the ultimate reference point at the moment is Sweden. 100%. I don't think Mexico will be challenging the top spot today for music. Sorry sorry to say. Sorry for the spoilers. Probably not. But, you know, we can start with the folksy vibes, starting with mariachi, which is one of the few types of music that you never need to know who sings it, who's playing it, whatever, mm-hmm. it will put a smile on your face. Instantly recognizable. Vibes from the word go. Yeah. These are like, it is insanely a, a cultural touchstone for so many people in the world. I'd, I would be super interested to know what percentage of the world can you put on this music? Mm. Da, 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 like yeah. something like that. And how quickly can they go, oh, Mexico, you know? Just, I, I would really say it's like a, decent percent like half the world yeah, it's probably. synonymous almost i would say exactly yeah. exactly and i think when you say mexico and music in the same sentence everybody's brain is going straight that to picture right da, yeah. Da, da. yeah exactly yeah. the guy's playing in a, in a what, standing up with an acoustic guitar and you know the whole the works you know and Love an it. accordion in the background whatever you want exactly yeah. exactly now in particular what still gives me goosebumps to go back and watch 
is <laughs> and sorry to keep bringing it back to Formula One is when the, the Formula One was in Mexico last year some absolute genius on the internet made a mariachi version of the Formula <laughs> One song and it, it went super viral in the days leading up to the Grand Prix and then Formula One actually played it after the race over it's the loudspeakers and it's, it's for anyone who hasn't seen it and who knows what the Formula One theme is go look it up it's an absolute banger but in any case what a touchstone for the world for world music and okay none of us can name let's say these uh, these artists, right, who are behind no. mariachi, but we all can we all can recognize it instantly. It's a part of the cultural fabric, and also if you're in the U.S. at any Mexican or Tex-Mex restaurant and it's your birthday, oh, it's there. They'll come the, around. You're getting a happy you're birthday. The, yeah, big time. And then rock, Neil. So two points I wanted to touch on here. One, I don't know if you're familiar with them, but they are the highest grossing Latin American band of all time, Mana. Sadly not. Sadly no. not, but over yeah. 40 million records. That's huge. That's quite big, huh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And this reminds me a bit of our Japan discussion where probably a lot of those records were sold in Mexico, right? Yeah. But well, still- in, in the Spanish-speaking world, let's yeah, say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. True, true, true. Right. Which is big. Yeah. 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 So, but then what Rolling Stone ranked as the 20th greatest guitarist of all time, which I don't think was too generous. I think you could even go higher, at mm. least for mm. my generation and your generation, Absolutely. higher. And that is Carlos Santana. 100%. I think uh, he's a great example of what, if you want to get into the discussion of what is a good guitarist, Mm -hmm. it's a really interesting one to go down. Him and people like B.B. King, for example, where the temptation when you talk about guitarists is to be like, who's the quickest, most technical, who can do the craziest rip-roaring solos, right? And Santana, I think, or Carlos Santana is not about that so much. If you listen to the big classics like Black Magic Woman or one of those, Mm -hmm. right? The solos in there are actually very meditative or kind of thoughtful. Yeah, you're, it's trance, right? Yeah, yeah. And there's loads of room, right? The, especially listen to the opening guitar of Black Magic Woman. There's, n- you could learn as a beginner guitarist, you could learn that in like a week, probably mm-hmm. less even. Mm-hmm. It's actually extremely simple, but it's beautiful. And the, it's like full of emotion, full of actual feeling. And that's really, I think, the sign of a great guitarist is if they can somehow convey beyond just wow look at how fast he's able to do that or look at the you know cool chords and stuff it's like can you actually convey real emotion through what you're playing and improvise it and make it sound legitimate and authentic and unique so i think on that basis i i agree as well that he's probably one of the greatest no. not not to say that i know his back catalog inside out but i'm just so impressed with what i have heard have to uh, have to give it to him and and his endless collaborations with the biggest artists of the day for now the past 40 years everyone wants to work with Carlos Santana right and he's got his niche he perfects that and he also adapts it to to whoever he's working with so yeah I mean for me personally because to be honest nowadays now you were in the industry the music industry but for someone like me that's not (laughs) yeah how many guitarists can I name Mm. you know because we're Mm. not in the Keith Richards etc days anymore no that's true so if you ask me, name a guitarist who is still active in 2023, yeah. I would say Carlos Santana. Yeah, he'd actually. be probably your first one, right? First one. Like, yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, his his influence is, it, like we talked about with Sweden, where we have these producers who you might not know, but you've definitely heard. Yeah. He also has a little bit of that, I think. He has a, a back catalog, and I'm just even just talking about his collabs, right? Mm-hmm, He's mm-hmm. been working with the likes of, from one end of the scale, Herbie Hancock, Bob Dylan. Well, and then you can take that... In the total other direction, he's talking to Lauren Hill, Michael Jackson, Dave Matthews Band. He has worked on Dora the Explorer. Or Explorer, that's legendary, right? So like he and he's just like firing on all cylinders. He's worked with Shakira. He's worked with such amazing artists, right? That and such such a broad spectrum of artists. It's like guaranteed that everyone who's listening to this has heard him. You know? Yeah. So I think you got to give something for that. That's that's pretty huge. When it comes to guitarists, he's the legend uh, at the moment. Only other thing I have here is Luis Miguel. Hmm. singer of love pop ballads throughout the the 80s and 90s Hmm. um but uh you're not familiar with lost me there it's one of those names that probably if i heard a song i'd be like oh yeah that guy but i'm not uh not there sadly so that's mexican music for you in a nutshell let's also give a shout out to cumbia yeah big rival of 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 salsa in terms of that Uh that uh that latin dance music and here you know what are we scoring it's actually a tricky one this one because Sweden got itself a five, right? Through ABBA plus a bunch of producers, like it was some, and, and then and the whole house and techno scene yeah, on top yeah. of it. And we're not. This isn't a five, I think. 
No. However, Santana is huge, Carlos Santana. Mm. And you do have mariachi, which is just iconic. In terms of the uniqueness, mariachi. Yeah. Yeah. Like there's, you'd be hard pushed to find another genre, you know, that's so representative and so intrinsically linked to a country. So actually I'm, I'm, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I'm also leaning towards a four. You're leaning towards a four, which is yeah. highly influential on a global oh, scale. Okay, no, no, yeah, no I, I didn't mean to laugh. No, I'm no, just, no. Wow. Your, your, your questioning is fair. I just, I feel like three almost feels like an injustice to the country that mm. gave us mariachi music, you know? And Carlos Santana. And Carlos Santana. Oh, okay, well, let's see what you go and then I'll, I'll lock in more. Okay, well, okay. so I was more, it would be an injustice to give a two, oh, okay. which is significant in terms of uniqueness or success. <laughs> or success. I'm going to give yeah. a three because somewhat significant in terms of uniqueness with the mariachi and then success, it is... It is Carlos Santana stealing mm. for home plate to use a baseball okay. analogy, which you yeah. love. I'm yeah, going to yeah, go yeah. with a three, but I think it's what, close. I think to look back at our definition, right? It's like uniqueness and success. And uniqueness, big tick in the box with Mariachi. Success, mm-hmm. big tick in the box with Carlos Santana. But then what? You yeah. know? Do you yeah. have do you have example number two and three and four and five? And that's where I get a bit lost, maybe. Yeah. So I actually think I need to retract my four and join you on the three. Okay. That's threes all around on music for Mexico. Yeah. And now, Neil, we have a few more categories to choose from. Mm. We have literature, we have cuisine, and then last, we'll have the wild card. So do you want literature or cuisine? Let's let's bang out literature because I feel like this will be a flying visit. Yeah. So literature, not much, even for me, which, you know, this is one of my favorite categories to Mm. to dive into as we did for for Sweden and Japan as well. Uh, Octavio Paz. He won the 1990 Nobel Prize for poetry. Uh, I know you're a big fan of those poems. You read them to uh, Every to day. Euro. Every day. You know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, gotta be honest here, listeners. So this is a swing and a miss for me in terms of my engagement with the topic. I sometimes, when I know what's coming up on the podcast, I can sometimes do a deep dive in short uh, short order and just get, get up to speed on something, as I often have done. This was not one of those times. I am fully uninitiated. Yeah. Mexican literature. I have, and, I have nothing to say here. And then we have Carlos Fuentes. He was part of that Latin American boom and, you know, uh, magical realism, etc. in the 60s uh-huh. and 70s, but still not the household name that Gabriel Garcia Marquez from, from Colombia would be, for example, with 100 Years of Solitude and mm. Love mm. in a Time of Cholera. So it's very difficult to give this anything more than a one yeah. which is little significance in terms of uniqueness and success and remember listeners yeah. we are talking about global impact yeah. here do not come for us i can imagine any mexican listener boiling now all with the rage. mexican librarians just absolutely boiling over with rage i fully understand you and i apologize if that has been our impact and can only echo your point nicola which is like we are two ignorant uh, Westerners. We do not know what we're saying. We're just talking about what we understand. <laughs> we only are just saying what we understand about this topic, which is, in my case, zero. So it's a one, though, right? It's a, it's a solid score. one. Yeah, I would go zero if I could, but we don't have a scale for that. One's all around on literature. And from our name categories, it seems we've saved the best oh, for last. We absolutely have. My only regret is that we will go over time unless I keep this... Uh, short and sweet we've got to i mean respect to the mexican cuisine oh. which easily one of the top in my opinion one of the top five cuisines in the world probably one of the top three i'll go out on a limb and say together with the mm. japanese and italian whoa um unesco has even recognized the mexican cuisine as a of intangible cultural heritage it is a protected cuisine by the united nations neil just absolute banger cuisine like see and i don't use that phrase lightly it is something else i probably i would have to put italy first but i think it's my number two like on the global scale yeah it is special chili mais tacos tostadas gorditas enchiladas guacamole tamales we can go on for days oh my god it's just all incredible my biggest regret is that i actually haven't gotten there gotten there to try it myself you've got to it's 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 an experience yeah yeah, it's on my list. I, I will get there. It's just such a, it's such a trek, like from here, you know, to, to get, it, there's no direct flights. You need to do the whole yeah, thing. Yeah. So it's going to, we're going to get there. It's just a question of when, not if, but my God, even if it's anything like what I've had, you know, here or elsewhere, Mexican food, just sign me up. 
it's it's unbelievable and there's so much you can do with it so much versatility even just think of how many different variations of, of tacos you can have you yeah. can with fish tacos or, or whatever right and amazing like what it's done with the avocado in terms of creating guacamole it's arguably sweet. the best dip of all time and if you don't like that well then there's also salsa yeah you you will always i think anybody would find something they love actually in mexican food yeah i was first introduced to it myself actually in around i'm gonna say the oh five six seven kind of okay. time when uh ireland is is a, a country of crazes and fads it's particularly among the teenagers right and it went from zero to a hundred in terms of burrito restaurants. So not tacos, actually. Just burrito. I don't think tacos ever really got huge in Ireland, actually. Mm-hmm. But burritos got absolutely enormous. It became the most competitive eatery scene in Dublin. Yeah. There was ones popping up on every corner. Only the strong survived. We were comparing what were the prices, what you could get. Was guacamole extra? Uh-huh. Could you get, you know, chili? Or was the cheese in there? Were the beans good? All these things. It was massive. So that was my introduction and I fell in love with burritos at that time. Still love a good burrito. A little bit heavy maybe. Maybe, I, maybe I'm dialing it down a little bit now. And then it was only, you know, over the years that followed that I got to try all the different things we just mentioned. Tacos, which are now massively popular still, I think, in uh, in Copenhagen as well as elsewhere. Yeah. You, can, you can get some pretty premium tacos, but uh, just love it. Like, it's it gets me, this food. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's one of my go-to. You know, if you have to order in on a Friday or Saturday night, solid. I'm all about getting the burrito or the tacos or... Mexican right. is really, honestly, a top three at least. It, so sad. Yeah. it could contend. Mm. Well, could I, I alienate our, our Italian no, community? No, 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 I can't do. Not in terms of pop no, culture. And sorry, stuff. Italy no. has to. You, it's, I know. I, I know this isn't the Italy episode, but come on, like pasta pizza, just already. Yeah, you're yeah. done. You're done there. But yeah, I mean Mexican food. Yeah, burritos great as well. Th- there is a point here also of like kiss, right? Keep it simple, scholar or stupid mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, of don't overdo it with with mexican food just yeah 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 yeah. if you look at the i was watching a a documentary on netflix called taco chronicles Mm -hmm. where they go one taco at a time so it's just carnitas or it's just you know whatever Mm. i I can't even remember all the different types right where it spends a whole episode just on that type and it goes through different makers of different specialists in that one taco recipe my stomach is, is oh, man. rumbling you gotta right watch now. it it's, it's like mouth watering stuff but what you see there is that actually it really just comes down to the meat the marinade for that meat and then a little bit of something on top that's all they actually want and then, then you see that and that's it we i think here in europe are a lot better at just going nuts with it and like overcomplicating it exactly like putting so much extra on it i actually had a bit of a bad experience in a restaurant called sanchez in copenhagen oh yeah which is a re- it's mexican right but it's like fancy mexican yeah where we got through the whole meal with no meat which i'm okay with i'm not against that it, and it, there was some fish stuff but like it had no right to be as pretentious as it was and i would have loved it had one of the meals just been a big fat burrito you know I would have, that would have made me way happier, actually. Yeah, yeah, definitely. In terms of just getting all your vitamins and enjoying, and it is to an extent a comfort food, and I and I mean oh. that in in the, in the nicest way possible. But it's okay for it to be that. Right? I'm actually I'm this close to ordering some actually as soon as we finish. <laughs> yeah, and while we're on on cuisine, uh, what about tequila? <laughs> yeah, because we we haven't had this before in the other country discussions. But food, I think, should also include drink, right? Yeah. We forgot to mention sake for Japan, but yeah. they were a five anyway. That was a solid it, so. five, yeah. and actually, I'm not the biggest sake fan ever. But no, um, and even with Sweden, you know, we could have gone into uh, some some of their lovely beverages, but well, they uh, would have lost points for those. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But uh, no, in in terms of Mexico, I think tequila is a global phenomenon. Actually, I think it's. It's worth remembering that there's not many drinks that have a ritual of salt and biting a citrus fruit mm. in the club, right? And pretty much, it seems universal that like... In the club. In the club. Like, in a, <laughs> how, many, how many countries have a drink that has this whole ritual attached to it, really? Like, it is so yeah. unique. I don't know how authentic it really is or whatever, but we all do it, right? Uh, I think it's, it's quite cool in a way. Now, I, I've been the victim of tequila many times, of course, and it is dangerous. It's so nice and uh in- enjoyable and you can actually get really into it. it there are fans of tequila in the same way there are fans of whiskey you know that yeah absolutely you can get very into it i think i haven't myself but it can be a, a connoisseur's uh, beverage as well but that's huge the the um the contribution i think there shouldn't be understated the impact is massive even for someone like me that doesn't drink much mm. if i had to choose a shot of any liqueur yeah 
it would be tequila yeah. 10 times out of 10 actually i and i also because of what you said i genuinely enjoy that ritual it is something special as opposed to you know just taking vodka now of course mm. those listeners will come for us from the vodka loving countries but it's tequila all the way for me i think so bit of flavoring bit of uh, herbal uh, ar- aromatics to it i think it's uh it's it's the clear liquor for me i can say that much and before we round it off are you a taco man or a burrito man see i've evolved i was you, you heard in my teenage years mm-hmm. i was a burrito guy i think done at their best let's compare both at their best i think tacos win they're just so perfect bite-sized morsels three bites and you're done yes yeah. oh amazing and fish tacos yeah. with like some really fresh shrimps yeah. and stuff oh, like can you beat that shrimp oh my god i think shrimp is just goat level fish i think it's probably the best fish but yeah or seafood i suppose but in any case yeah i think a taco has to win right like but tacos can also be horrifically bad mm. i've had some really bad ones here actually even in good restaurants where i would normally have a good experience sometimes you just get a dud and it's like okay yeah. this, this is a bit dry you know this can pork help. is this pork hasn't been fully you know marinated to the right extent or whatever so it can happen and burritos, I think, are consistently good. Like, you'll never go below a six on a burrito, I think. Absolutely. Even a bad burrito you're going to like, I think. But then a good burrito also can be phenomenal. Yeah. I, uh, there's one place in Dublin called Boojum, which uh, mm. I was a religious fan of for many years. And probably anyone in Dublin uh, goes there regularly still who, who likes burritos. It's one of the best places to get them. But in any case, one for our, uh, when we go on the road and we, we hit Dublin, we can uh, try a Boojum. Absolutely. And in the meantime, I think it goes without saying that it's... Fives all around. Oh, absolutely. Sorry if we that. could give it a six. Yeah, I would be all over it with a six. This is a strong five for me. Not that we'd rate them too strongly or, or weekly per number, but like this is a an easy five. Absolutely. So we're coming down to our wild card. Our wild card is our special category where we throw out any other sort of pop culture references which didn't fit into the other categories that mm. could boost the country's score. At the moment, just an overview of where we stand. We are currently, Neil, at 15.5 out of a possible 25. So with this wild card, uh, it can't beat Japan, which is at a 22.5, but it could overcome Sweden, which is at a 19.5. So it's down to the wire. Pressure is on, yeah. Now, for the wild card, where to start but festivals and parties exactly i think this is the best this is the great thing about our system is that the wild card aspect allows us to capture things that you have to cover but just unfortunately haven't fallen in to any other part of the discussion and come on like when you think of mexico where does your mind go first but the festivals yeah the the buntings that get hung up the masks the face paint like the parades all of it it's it's a fest it's a party country yeah yeah Yeah, absolutely dia de los muertos day of the dead right iconic unique it's even been featured as we mentioned in james bond specter exactly right? exactly among and, uh, coco as well the the disney movie got a big shot it's basically based around the day of the dead uh, absolutely aesthetic, yeah. and in my spanish class in in middle school actually that was like a huge um, eye-opener uh, about the mexican culture when mm. around those uh, days of the first second of november we would cover dia de los muertos and and see yeah. okay and the way they pitch it to it is like, oh, this is how they do kind of Halloween, but they did it first and they did it better and they kind of continued. to. Yeah, And exactly. it's very serious and there's so much ritual around it and Absolutely. so much intricacy and in everything that's going out. It's, it's truly amazing. This, again, when we come to the word uniqueness, right? Like we talked with the Lucha Libre, this is an example of something that is so clearly defined, so fiercely independently itself where it's like, this is how we do it. We do the little flower thing around the eyes. We do the face paint and that's it. Like, we're not changing it. We're not going to adapt it to anything else. It's so like richly historic and so itself that I just have to give it a huge shout out. I think it's such a cool aesthetic that they own. It's brilliant. And then of course, because you can't go a whole year without a festival or a party, they really commemorate Cinco de Mayo as they did a few days ago. Yeah. Even here, I was in Copenhagen uh, with my wife. We were going out to get a coffee on the 5th of May, okay. which happens to also be a holiday in denmark which is being taken away for different reasons 
Uh, and there were Mexican flags kind of all around uh, over there in our neighborhood. And there was a big barbecue and big grill, uh, of course, to commemorate them beating the French way back in, in 1862. Just uh, always but, worth celebrating. Yeah, yeah. But Cinco de Mayo is also something iconic. For me, when I was at school in the U.S., it was still something, again, like something really that we traveled. learned about. And it really traveled. And, yeah. yeah. It's almost a weird one because like they have an independence day like yeah. the, a, and it's not that right? exactly yeah. september 16th of course man shout out for my birthday but uh absolutely <laughs> which we forget very about every special year. day very special day but um no I, i'm just surprised at how big cinco de mayo has become given it's like a celebration of something quite like in, it's, sure it's significant but it's not like formative in mexican history yes okay it was it was an important battle that they won uh but uh, against the french who yeah. never seemed to really win Many exactly. I think maybe that's why I traveled so much is that other countries were like, oh, oh, we're definitely celebrating that. Like US <laughs> French jumps on it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Jump on that. Yeah. But yeah, I love it. Like, of course, we've all heard of Cinco de Mayo. As, a, as an Irish person who has never lived in that part of the world, I haven't really experienced it at all. But I've still, there you go. I've heard of it. Yeah, so, hey, I mean, that's, that's saying something. Huge no? pop culture credentials. And yeah. then they also do carnival almost to the level of the Brazilians. Exactly, yeah. And I, I was introduced to carnival when I lived in Portugal. And I think basically any Latinx slash Hispanic country has a version of it. it. It originates in Spain, right? But when I was researching this, I also found that it's popular to different extents in these countries. Mm -hmm. And actually Mexico is probably one of the biggest celebrants of it. So even though they haven't originated it, they are huge, huge fans of carnival. So doing the whole routine, costumes, dressing up a bit like Halloween, but it's more in like the April time of year. Uh, massive, yeah. And there we go. Um, any other shout outs for this wild card for Mexico? Well, not in this topic of, of like festivals and celebrations, because I think that's, they've got that on lock, right? Yeah. They've, they've got that locked down. The only other notes I had is like, let's make sure we give a shout out to Frida Kahlo. We've got point. to. So like huge and still omnipresent. You can see she features actually a lot in art exhibitions here in Denmark, actually. Yeah, in yeah, Louisiana, yeah. you'll see stuff uh, from Frida She'll Kahlo. be on t-shirts, like yeah. still an, an icon, a bit like people getting her tattooed, like they yeah, get yeah, yeah. Che Guevara tattooed under biceps and 100%. stuff. It's really... Uh, yeah, so like massive figure, one of the yeah. most famous political figures or m most famous figures, full stop, right? Yeah, absolutely. So massive shout out to Frida. And I guess we, we covered, thankfully, the Mayans and the Aztec civilizations, but that was also something that I wanted to make sure we dropped in because it's like one of their biggest collaborations, one of their biggest uh, contributions, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Even more advanced than the, the Romans, the Greeks and the Egyptians probably combined mm. without actually having any contact with that part of the world. Like, think of how impressive that That's is. That's insane. And it's a testament to human nature in, in a sense that like, it wasn't a fluke, right? We we are creatures who are destined to develop and grow and have things like architecture and design and science and maths and stuff like that. So I think it's really nice. and it, it, Well said. Yeah, I think it's a, a great evidence of the power of humanity. That's wow. uh, inspiring stuff. Just bringing Tearing a tear to my eye. Yeah, yeah. So on that wild card, we've modeled it a bit because we've added a bunch of things. It's a bit of a mixed bag, but... Mm. I think let's be strict though. I think for the wild card to work as a... As a system going forward it has to be limited to like a topic right exactly so let's treat this i think as festivals parties that kind of thing okay let's and do it ditch the other stuff we just yeah. talked about yeah and where do you score it on that so on festivals slash parties etc actually actually it's pretty high yes because i'm the first thing that comes to mind is like what other countries do you have on this one and you have like carnival in in brazil you have like mm -hmm. a few examples you do so, actually it's yeah. quite good i'm actually going to lean on a four for this one four is highly influential on a global scale i think the reason i will match your four is because although they didn't necessarily invent all of these they've kind of done them better and done mm. them so well to a point where they are iconic and in the zeitgeist even for somebody in ireland that Probably. has never been to mexico or speak spanish like that's speak a word. the like, proof is in the pudding exactly exactly and all all that is is like i consume say american film and, that, and it's all over there you know mm -hmm. like you you kind of can't avoid it i just think it's uh, that says a lot right now if i was to think is it quite like ireland st patrick's day levels globally right maybe not there's probably a little bit less celebration of mm -hmm. cinco de mayo on a global scale so i could give it a five let's say for that reason but still Amazing. Yeah, absolutely. So let's sum everything up here, listeners. Mexico scored a 3 for music, a 2.5 for film and TV, a 1 on literature, 
to be rebounded by a 5 on cuisine, arguably one of the best cuisines in the world, a 4 on sport and a very strong 4 on the wildcard category of festivals and parties. This takes Neo Mexico to a grand total of 19.5 oh. equal to Sweden for second place in the running order after Japan. Wow, join second. We've done it already. After only three countries, we have a tie. Jeez. That's all it took. That's all it took. So, of wow. course, Sweden with only 10 million and mm -hmm. some change in habitants will come up higher in the per capita index. But Absolutely. who's to say that these will be scores to beat? These 19.5s and 22.5 for Japan. Phenomenal stuff. Any parting shots for our listeners before we get out of here, Neil? Thanks for joining us, listener. This has been a fun little tour of Mexico, especially for the uninitiated Mexican like myself. Uh, interested to know if we missed anything, got anything wrong, left anything out. So, of course, shout us out on the old Twitter, on the Gmail, on, on every possible avenue. We'd love to hear from you. Until next time, listeners.